Much of Irish history is about myth. Myth, in one sense, is an imaginative, uplifting way of telling things as people would like them to have been, rather than the way they actually were. But myth is also a way of so telling things because this imaginative way expresses a deeper truth than the plain appearance of events. Certainly, Irish history shows continually the power of myth to change reality. In reality, the Fenians were a failure, but later men, looking back at their failure, were to turn it to a sort of triumph. To understand the 19th century Fenians, you have to start at the time of the terrible experience the Irish people passed through in the 1840s, the Great Famine. Their sufferings had been indescribable. Ireland had lost over a quarter of its population because at a time when other food was plentiful, the potato fields, on which the poor normally survived, had withered with blight. A million and a half had emigrated. Perhaps as many as a million had died. Just before this great national calamity, there died a young man, Thomas Davis, who'd been trying to develop among Irish Protestants and Catholics alike a renewed sense of nationality. He and his friends Gavin Duffy and John Blake Dillon had started a paper, The Nation, to be the voice of a young Ireland movement fostering national ideals. But with the famine, bitterness and desperation overtook young Ireland, particularly one John Mitchell who started a more aggressive paper, The United Irishman. When Mitchell was arrested, his mantle fell on an improbable new leader, an old Herovian ex-member of Parliament, Smith O'Brien, who in the summer of 1848 found himself in Tipperary in the neighbourhood of this farmhouse, desperately trying to raise the peasantry in arms. The farmhouse is little changed today. A warrant was soon out for Smith O'Brien's arrest. A party of police of the Irish Constabulary, a recently formed paramilitary force armed with rifles in the Queen's name, had first moved towards the little village of Ballingarry, which is over there, where O'Brien was, meaning to arrest him. But uh, discouraged by the barricades which they found up there and the large numbers of people they found milling about in uh, indeterminate mood, but some of them armed, they prudently decided to withdraw to this little farmhouse on the top of a hill about a mile and a half away. The house was owned by a widow named McCormack. Uh, she was out at the time, but her five children were inside when what was then her cabbage garden was tramped through by a sub-inspector and 46 men of the Irish constabulary, who then proceeded to enter through the front door singing the British Grenadiers. They immediately started to break up the furniture and put the house into a state of defence. Meanwhile, Smith O'Brien, accompanied by one or two of his young island lieutenants and some 40 or so of the peasantry armed with guns and pikes and even the occasional scythe and followed by a crowd of curious onlookers, made his way up here to try and dissuade the police from arresting him altogether. He just got here when the widow McCormack herself arrived and seeing that there was some plan to set fire to some straw in order to smoke the police out from here, she implored him to save her five children and her house from destruction, whereupon he desisted from that plan. But he then came up to the window here and tried to persuade the police inside to surrender as good Irishmen. But they, as good Irishmen, replied that they'd rather forfeit their lives. So he said he'd give them five minutes to think it over and began to walk away when uh, there was a cry from the crowd out here of uh, slash away boys and slaughter them. And um, uh, stones were thrown at the house, possibly a shot was fired. Anyway, the police, who were nervous obviously, fired a powerful volley down into the crowd and two of the would-be besiegers were killed, several wounded, though none of the police were hurt. 
One of those wounded was a young man named James Stevens, who'd been one of O'Brien's lieutenants. The mob dispersed, Smith O'Brien himself and Stevens making off into the countryside as best they could, Stevens with a slight wound in the leg. Such was the so-called Rising of 1848, an event which a later Irish nationalist of the 20th century, Patrick Pierce, was to refer to as one of the six occasions in the past 300 years when the Irish nation had asserted its right in arms to national sovereignty and freedom. It's more truthfully known as the Battle of the Widow McCormick's Cabbage Garden. While Stevens managed to escape, O'Brien was arrested on Thurley's railway station a few days later, lodged in gentlemanly enough fashion in jail, but charged with high treason and taken through the full rigor of a state trial in which he was condemned to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. His sentence was eventually commuted to exile in Tasmania. But what of Stevens? James Stevens had never been captured. He'd escaped to France, where he fought on the barricades in the insurrection of 1851, contacting the French revolutionary secret societies of that day. These secret societies utterly absorbed Stevens's mind, and he began to think of applying their techniques to nationalism in Ireland. In 1856, Stevens returned to Ireland, determined to use secret society techniques for Irish national freedom. Every other desire of my soul, he wrote, shrinking into the merest insignificance before this all-absorbing determination. He set out on a 3,000-mile journey, mainly on foot, to try and assess the state of Irish national feeling. There had been a report that Stevens's wound at the Battle of the Widow McCormick's Cabbage Garden was a mortal one, and there had even been an obituary of him published in a newspaper. There were those who believed him to be a ghost as he tramped the countryside. Other people, less superstitious, regarded him as an imposter. As he passed on his way through towns and villages from which he'd been absent for eight years, he felt himself at first an isolated figure and was even sometimes taken for a foreigner in his persistent quest for Irish nationalist ideals, which seemed to have very little reality to the ordinary Irish people of that day. The people, Stevens decided, are in a hopeless state of inactivity. Political life is dead. He'd set out on his walk with one big question in his mind. Was Ireland ready for a secret revolutionary organization under his leadership? In his native Kilkenny, once center of the Young Ireland movement, Young Ireland was now forgotten. Yet Stevens's confidence in himself was such that he couldn't help feeling that the Irish people must be sound at heart and that he alone was capable of organizing them. He went by train to see his old leader, Smith O'Brien, who'd been reprieved from his exile and was now living quietly in County Limerick. But from Smith O'Brien, Stevens heard only a depressing opinion. 
You see, Mr. Stevens, the respectable people of the towns especially are quite indifferent to, if not hostile to, Irish nationality. Yet, as he confidently persisted in his search for contacts and information, Stevens felt his confidence began to be rewarded, and he thought always of the possibility of help from America. I saw the eyes of artisans and laborers light up to the glow of indescribable ardor when I spoke to them of their brothers beyond the seas, of the new and greater Ireland in the Western Republic, and reminded them that the cause which braved so many dangers had got enough life left in it to rise once more in the near future to the position it deserved to enjoy. The Irish countryside itself was already riddled with secret societies of one sort. Those agrarian secret societies, known now as ribbon men, who, with often crude and rough justice, protected the interests of the peasantry and small farmers against large farmers and landlords and against possible eviction, where the law did nothing to protect them. But though it was agrarian matters, with a tinge of nationality, which motivated them, Stephen saw them as a basis for a wide popular nationalist movement, particularly if combined with the social disaffection which he found among the working classes of the times. But whereas the leadership of the ribbon organizations often appeared crude and was limited in national outlook, Stevens was determined to fashion something on a higher national plane. He eventually arrived back to the Dublin of 1856 with the conviction, much encouraged by young Ireland comrades from America, that what Ireland needed was a secret revolutionary organization which he must found. And it was in Dublin on St. Patrick's Day, the 17th of March, 1858, in a yard somewhere off Lombard Street, that Stevens founded that secret organization, later to become known as the Irish Republican Brotherhood. It's an appropriately hole and corner sort of place for him to have done so in, because it was to be, for very many years, a hole and corner sort of organization. Stevens and his fellow conspirators here swore themselves in, in the presence of God, to renounce all allegiance to the Queen of England and to take arms and fight at a moment's warning and to make Ireland an independent democratic republic and to yield implicit obedience to the commanders and superiors of this secret society. Bold words in the context of a time in which almost no one in Ireland seemed the slightest bit interested in making Ireland an independent democratic republic. Stevens was determined that his organization should not be broken by informers. And he devised rather an elaborate security system of closed circles in which only one man had contact with the next circle. And this was for a time very effective, so much so in fact that later in the year when the government got onto one of his circles in Cork, they didn't realize what they'd got onto. They caught one of his men, a young man named Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosser, swearing in members of the Irish Republican Brother. But he was able to pass himself off as simply one of a bunch of rather foolish young men in the district and the whole thing blew over when a Donovan Rosser and the others let themselves be bound over to keep the peace. Stevens, meanwhile, had gone off to America to raise money, firm up contacts, and with a former comrade of 1848, John O'Mahony, found the American part of the organization, the Fenian Brotherhood. <laughs> The 
name Fenia came from a legendary ancient Gaelic warrior elite, the Fena. And here in the United States, the Fenians were able to be an open legal organization, much as the Irish Northern Aid Committee is today able to be an open legal organization, raising money and giving it to people who give it to the IRA. Then, in 1858, when Stevens first came here, the United States contained vast potential resources in the form of men and money, which could, in theory, be used actively for the Irish cause. Millions of Irish men and women had emigrated to the United States from Ireland during and since the famine, nearly all of them with a terrible bitterness towards Britain in their hearts. I say nearly all, because I suppose the babes in arms didn't actually have it, but uh, they were to learn it soon enough at their mother's knee. As these immigrants settled down in the new republic, finding work, and even when poor, enjoying a relative prosperity compared with what they'd left behind in Ireland, this bitterness turned easily into a doctrinaire, anti-British, nationalistic republicanism. An Irish nationalism which gave them status in their new country, America, rather than involving them very directly with Irish affairs in Ireland. And Stevens was more than once to show exasperation with what he called Irish tinsel patriots, with their speeches of bayonets, gala days and jolly nights, banners and sashes, bunkum and filibustering, responding in glowing language to glowing toasts on Irish national independence over beakers of fizzling champagne. But on this first visit, Stevens's fellow Irishman made all the right noises for him. Are you ready? All the way. I support the Patriots. The men here are fighting for their freedom. But all of our money is coming from working men that give a dollar or two here. My firm resolution, wrote Stevens in his American diary, is to establish a democratic republic in Ireland. Stevens was hailed as the wolf tone of his generation. In 1861, in San Francisco, the Fenians there made a practical gesture to help Stevens's organization in Ireland. Early that year, a minor figure of the former Young Ireland movement, Terence Ballou McManus, died in San Francisco, and Fenians there sent his body back to Ireland. Stevens, now back in Ireland himself, organized a great funeral through the streets of Dublin as a demonstration for the national cause and to publicize the virtues of men like McManus and himself, who'd taken to arms, however shakily, in 1848. Stevens's arrangements for the funeral were an outstanding success. On a cold and cheerless November morning, more than 12,000 Dubliners turned out to watch the hearse on its way to Glasnevin Cemetery. The Archbishop of Dublin, later Cardinal Cullen, strongly condemned the tradition of violence that was being extolled in the funeral. And he denounced, as the church must, all secret societies. He refused to let McManus's body lie in state in the pro-cathedral. But Stevens found a radical priest to deliver the funeral oration. Though the prophet be dead, 
cried this priest. The spirit he evoked will outlive him, and even in this generation, raise this country from degradation to the glory of a nation. From this moment on, Stevens' organization began to flourish. In public houses and other meeting places all over the country, men began to take the Fenian oath. I, William McCarthy. I, Patrick Welsh. I, Lawrence Redmond. I, John O'Brien, in the presence of Almighty God, do solemnly swear allegiance to the Irish Republic, now virtually established, and that I will do my very utmost at every risk while life lasts to defend its independence and integrity. And finally, that I will yield implicit obedience in all things, not contrary to the law of God, to the commands of my superior officers. So help me God. Amen. So help me God. So help me God. Amen. So help me God. Amen. In the summer of 1863, Stevens greatly increased his hold on Irish opinion by starting his own newspaper, The Irish People which became an undercover propaganda sheet for the Fenians. The members of the editorial board were all members of Stevens's central secret committee. Thomas Luby, the nominal proprietor. John O'Leary, the editor. Jeremiah O'Donovan Rosser, the manager. And Charles Kickham, himself later to be head of the Irish Republican Brotherhood. But Stevens himself fully controlled the paper's policy and was soon calling himself Chief Organiser of the Irish Republic. While flirting openly with the language of violence, publishing articles on military matters and openly proclaiming that parliamentary methods were inadequate for the desired goal of total Irish independence, the Irish people managed just to keep on the right side of the law. One way it did so was by continuously and effectively publicizing the Fenian cause in America. It reported, too, on the American Civil War, now raging between North and South. outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861 had temporarily absorbed the energies of Irish emigrants to the United States in the terrible and bloody events of their new country. But at least this had the advantage for Stevens of training vast numbers of Irishmen in modern warfare because there were Irish regiments fighting prominently on both the Union and Confederate sides. In 1864, Stevens came to the United States again to recruit for the Fenian Brotherhood among the Union armies of the North. He did this with his usual energy and determination, was met with much enthusiasm, and declared his recruiting drive an outstanding success. So much so that by the end of the year, he was able to write claiming that he had 100,000 men ready to fight in Ireland. And he wrote saying this to his old comrade of young Ireland days, John O'Mahony, who was the nominal head of the Fenian Brotherhood here and who was fighting then with the Union armies of the North. Uh, Stevens added in his letter to O'Mahony, let no man for a moment doubt that we are bound to action next year. I ask you, in the name of God, to believe that no man after us can bring the cause to the test of battle, and that our battle must be entered into sometime in the coming year. And 
as the Civil War moved towards its close, it began to look as if Stevens's exhortations might indeed be turned into reality. Back in Ireland, too, the feeling was growing that 1865 would be the year of action. Stevens's man, John Devoy, was busy there recruiting among soldiers in British-Irish regiments, swearing them into the organization when off duty. Secret meetings were being held all over the country, not only in public houses, but in upstairs rooms where manuals of military warfare were studied and tactics discussed. News of such gatherings was being passed on furtively in the streets, in alleyways and doorways off them. And among the crowds at sporting events. Above all, drilling was taking place. Mainly in the countryside and usually at dusk or at night, when ghostly bodies of Fenians could be glimpsed parading and manoeuvring for the great day which was about to dawn and reinforcements were on their way from America. With the surrender of the South in the Civil War, Irish-American soldiers from both sides had been making their way across the Atlantic to Dublin, many of them easily recognizable by their felt hats and square-toed boots. Then, in September 1865, reality broke in as crowds gathered at the Irish people office to hear that a government informer had been at work there and that the news was that for all Stevens's precautions, the entire editorial staff had been arrested. O'Leary, Luby, and Rosser were all taken to jail. Stevens, however, chief organizer of the Irish Republic, escaped arrest for a time, only to be betrayed by yet another informer two months later and arrested. His security network had broken down. Stevens was lodged here in Richmond Jail, as it then was, in Dublin. And with the chief organiser of the Irish Republic thus safely inside, people felt they could sleep safely in their beds again. It's true there were a number of uh, Irish-American veterans of the American Civil War still hanging about Dublin, but on the whole it seemed as if the danger of a Fenian rising was over. And yet, it was from here that Stevens was to carry out his most effective single piece of action to boost the morale of the Fenian cause. Because two of the warders here were already secret members of his organization, and with their help, he was brought out of his cell one stormy night in the middle of November 1865. He was brought to a point in the wall here from the other side of which, a prearranged escape party, headed by one of those Irish Americans, Colonel Kelly, threw over a rope ladder and Stevens got clean away. The chief organizer of the Irish Republic was now at large again. It was clear that the tentacles of his conspiracy spread everywhere, even to the very heart of Her Majesty's prisons. Would he now keep his oft-repeated vow to strike in arms in Ireland before the year was out. There were only a few weeks to go. No, he would not. An anxious public was being partly reassured by the arrests of Americans and other Fenians continually taking place as a result of government information. And the fact that so many of his key men were now behind bars convinced Stevens that it would be premature and desperate to try and rise at once, though those who'd rescued him were much disappointed by his decision particularly that American, Colonel Kelly, who now contrived to bring Stevens safely out of Ireland altogether and eventually across the Atlantic to America again. In New York, by the middle of 1866, Stevens, encouraged by his American contacts, was again boasting that he'd have an army fighting on Irish soil by the end of the year. By the end of the year, he was again urging the Irish-American Civil War veterans that there must be a postponement. This was too much for them, and they began to have serious doubts about Stevens's leadership. 
To put a, a kindly interpretation on this, he was calling the bluff of his own bombast, realising that things simply weren't ready for a rising in Ireland. To put a less kindly interpretation on it, he was scared. Certainly this is what the Irish-American veterans thought, and particularly that Colonel Kelly who'd helped him escape from Richmond jail and was now openly calling him a coward. They deposed Stevens from his leadership of the organisation in Ireland. Kelly took it over himself, and in January 1867, he sailed from New York, together with a number of other Irish-American veterans of the Civil War, determined to carry out a Fenian rising here in Ireland in 1867 at all costs. And that brings Stevens' own part in the Fenian story to a close. He was to hang about on the fringes of Irish revolutionary activity for many years. But by the end of the century, he was regarded as harmless enough by the British authorities to be allowed to settle in Ireland again, where he died as late as 1901 in his bed. But the men of action who in 1867 had taken over the movement he founded had made it possible for him to be interred, if not with glory, yet with some renown. West Central London was, curiously, in 1867, where the planning of the Fenian Rising by Irish Americans under Colonel Kelly took place. Habeas corpus had been suspended in Ireland, but not in England. So it was safer to plot here. The plan for Ireland itself was for guerrilla units to assemble in different parts of the country, with concentrations in Dublin, and the southwest. Pitched battles weren't contemplated. The outbreak was to be signalled on the 11th of February 1867 by a daring raid on Chester Castle in England, where a large supply of arms was to be captured to be shipped to Ireland for immediate use. On the morning of the 11th of February 1867, Irishmen with revolvers under their clothes were pouring into Chester by every train. Then at 1 p.m. came the news that the whole plan had been betrayed to the government by yet another informer. With remarkable deftness, the operation was called off in time, leaving the authorities mystified. A large haul of revolvers and ammunition dumped into the town's canals was what the police had to be content with. Three weeks later, at a railway station in Ireland, the Fenian Rising finally got off to an almost equally abortive start. For as a train brought a self-styled Fenian general into Limerick Junction, to take command of guerrilla operations in the southwest, two men were waiting for him. They were from the police. The Fenian general, too, had been betrayed by an informer. At once he turned Queen's evidence and told them everything he knew. Unaware of the disaster, groups of Fenians duly rose and were in most cases quickly dealt with. At Talach, near Dublin, several hundred Fenians were dispersed by a volley from 14 police. Across the countryside, spasmodic raids took place against police barracks and other government installations, and there were about a dozen Fenian casualties. Some police barracks were taken, but the local leadership, though brave, was often amateurish, and casualties had a disproportionately discouraging effect on discipline. The rising did, however, cause some alarm. Before police and military successfully dealt with what, for all the proud boasts of organisation in Stevens's day, often turned out to be little more than vulnerable and ill-armed, if spirited, mobs. Mopping up operations by the army were soon underway. 
though there was one stand of a sort by Fenians in Tipperary. This ancient earthwork at Ballyhurst in County Tipperary was the scene of one of the last of those spasmodic encounters between Fenians and police and soldiers that constituted the Fenian rising of the night and morning of the 5th and 6th of March, 1867. You can see, once you're up here, why this lot of Fenians chose this particular place once they heard that the military were searching the countryside for them. Because from here, you get an excellent view both of the railway line running from Dublin to the south and of all the roads in the district. Selecting the position, however, was to be almost the sum total of Fenian military acumen displayed here. In command was one of the Irish-American Civil War veterans, T.F. Burke, promoted general in the Fenian cause. He had a shrunken leg, but that was no immediate disadvantage because he was mounted on a horse. He and his men had, in fact, been rather successfully carrying out sabotage in the surrounding area, tearing up telegraph poles and railway lines. But they proved rather better at sabotage than at open fighting, because when a party of soldiers approached the earthworks here, the Fenians inside fired one ragged volley at them and then fled in disorder. Burke himself galloped off in the opposite direction, crying, to the mountains, to the mountains. Into the mountains, pursued by flying columns of soldiers, came the scattered Fenians from Ballyhurst, falls of snow making their plight more desperate still. Their commander, Burke, didn't get that far, being brought down from his horse by a clever shot from a soldier at 300 yards range and being caught soon after limping along a hedge. In his pocket, incidentally, was found a new style Fenian oath to be administered to the civilian population in the event of victory and making them swear not to oppose the Irish Republic until relieved of the obligation. But of course, Ballyhurst was not only not a victory, it was a total disaster, like the whole Fenian Rising. And yet, this did not prevent the Fenians from entering into Irish national myth as heroes. Burke himself, before being sentenced to death, he was later reprieved, was able to speak grandly from the dock of his certainty that God, who'd preserved Ireland as a separate nationality for 700 years, notwithstanding all the tyranny to which he'd been subjected, would, for all the arrests of Fenians then taking place, assist her to retrieve her fallen fortunes and raise her in her beauty and her mystery. The Fenians might be safely in jail, but the idea that Ireland was a separate nation from Britain was still very much at large. The Fenians had made their contribution to the national myth. Characteristically, perhaps the most valuable part of the Fenian contribution to the myth took place here in Manchester, several months after the rising itself had ended in Debart. The Irish-American veteran, Colonel Kelly, now chief executive of the Irish Republic, had remained in England undetected in spite of a very intensive search for him. Then, on the 11th of September, 1867, the police arrested two men here in Manchester acting suspiciously in a doorway. They gave their names as Wright and Williams, and they were charged with loitering. But on being put in front of the informer Corridon, they were immediately recognized as a Captain Deasy, who'd been active in County Cork during the Rising, and no less than the chief executive of the Irish Republic himself, Colonel T.J. Kelly. A week later, the most important Fenian action of the year was fought here on the streets of Manchester. As an unescorted prison van, conveying Kelly and Deasy in handcuffs from the police court to Bellevue Jail, came through a railway arch, it was stopped and surrounded by about 30 Fenians who'd been lying in wait for it, some of them armed with revolvers. These forced the unarmed police on the outside of the van to get down and kept onlookers at bay while the others tried to batter open the van and rescue Kelly and Deasy from the cells inside. 
inside the van with the two Fenian prisoners was a police sergeant named Brett, who called upon through the ventilator to surrender, refused to do so. Whereupon one Fenian, aware that help for the beleaguered sergeant would soon be on the way, fired his revolver through the ventilator, although whether with intent to kill or frighten the sergeant or simply blast open the lock of the door, we'll never now know. What we do know is that the bullet mortally wounded Sergeant Brett. One of the women criminals was so frightened that she took the keys out of the hands of the dying sergeant and passed them through the ventilator. A minute later, Kelly and Deasy were free climbing over a wall and across a railway line, and they were never recaptured. It was the sequel to the Manchester rescue that was to be all important to the future. Charged with the murder of Sergeant Brett and taken in a prison van, accompanied by an understandably heavy police escort for trial, were five Irishmen. All five were found guilty of murder, and after the death sentence, one cried from the dock, God save Ireland, and they all repeated that. But the English public were outraged by what they saw as the murder of Brett, and his funeral in Manchester was an imposing affair. Three of the Irishmen found guilty were executed. Two were reprieved. Those executed, Allen, Larkin, and O'Brien. They were executed on a foggy morning in November 1867, and the atmosphere around the scaffold was so tense, with soldiers of the 72nd Highlanders placed round it, that when two explosions were heard nearby, the soldiers got ready to use their arms. But it was only the detonation of two fog signals on the railway line. Alan, Larkin and O'Brien had all been present at the attack on the van, but none had fired the fatal shot. And because of that, and because few people in Ireland believed that Sergeant Brett's death had been anything but a justifiable accident, Alan, Larkin and O'Brien have gone down to history as the Manchester Martyrs. Some died by the glenside, some died with the stranger, and wise men have told us their cause was a failure, but they stood by old Ireland and never feared danger. Glory, oh, glory, oh. I passed on my way, God be praised. Great mourning processions for the executed men, sometimes known as mock funerals with their empty hearses and full mourning array, were held in the cities of Ireland. We may have great men, but we'll never have better. Glory, oh, glory, oh, to the Bofinia. But that was by no means the end of the story. One afternoon at Westminster, ten years later, a debate on Irish affairs was taking place in the House of Commons when a Minister of the Crown, the Chief Secretary for Ireland, made a slighting reference to the Manchester murderers. No! No! This interruption took the Minister aback. He said he was sorry anyone in that house should apologise for murder. The right honourable gentleman looked at me so directly when he said that he regretted that any member of this house should apologise for murder, that I wish to say as publicly and directly as I can that I do not believe and never shall believe that any murder was committed at Manchester. That Irish member of parliament was Charles Stuart Parnell. Within a few years, he was to advance the Irish national cause 
to the very... F